here this morning with Richard Koo, Chief Economist of the Nomura Research Institute in Tokyo. He's also the author of The Holy Grail of Macroeconomics, a book that's had tremendous influence around the world. Leading American and European economists are now studying it, looking at the implications for their societies of what Richard calls the balance sheet recession that afflicted Japan for 15 years between 1990 and 2005. Balance sheet overhangs in the United States, balance sheet overhangs in peripheral Europe are now a big source of concern as everybody moves towards fiscal austerity. Richard, thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Thank I you. read uh, in the most recent uh, copy of your newsletter okay. that you were <clears throat> very interested in the quantitative easing too. Yes. The implications for the currency, the fallout of the uh, G20 meeting in mm -hmm. Seoul, and uh, how perhaps uh, from what we know about balance sheet recessions, that monetary expansion at this zero interest rate level right. may not be very effective. Uh, why don't you describe briefly your thoughts when you heard that Ben Bernanke was going to embark on this uh, second stage of quantitative easing? Well, I thought that was somewhat unfortunate because the so-called QE1, <clears throat> where he put in huge amount of liquidity to save the U.S. banking system, that part made sense in the sense that there was a financial crisis, there was a loss of confidence in the financial system, institutions, everybody was on defensive. Central bank was the only provider of liquidity to keep the things going. That part is fine. Any central bank faced with that kind of crisis, Lehman Shock, had to do that, and Japan had to do that too. When Sanyo Securities collapsed in 1997, was the first default in the so-called non-collateral coal market in Japan's history. Japanese companies all got really scared. The whole thing came to a grinding stop. It's kind of the Japanese Lehman. Yeah, that was yeah. the Japanese Lehman. Yeah. And the Bank of Japan pumped in huge sum of liquidity to get the things going again. But QE2, where the goal is no longer fixing the financial system, but to get the economy going, I'm afraid it's not going to produce the kind of uh, result that a lot of people are hoping for. Because I think what we have in the United States is a situation where even with zero interest rates, private sector is minimizing debt, so-called deleveraging. Mm -hmm. And they're deleveraging because all the assets they bought with borrowed funds during the bubble days have collapsed in value, but the liabilities are still on their books and their balance sheets underwater. And if you have cash flow, the right thing to do under the circumstances is to use the cash flow to pay down debt. But when everybody does it all at the same time, economy enters what I call fallacy of composition in that everybody's doing the right things, repairing balance sheets, but when everybody does it all at the same time, we enter a very uh, strange world that happens once maybe every 70 years. And that is that for a national economy, if someone is saving money or paying down debt, you better have someone on the other side borrowing and spending money. But when no one is borrowing, spending money, even with zero interest rates, everybody's deleveraging, what happens? Right? In the usual economy, if I'm a member of the household sector, I have $1,000 of income, I spend 900 myself, decide to save $100. $900 is already someone else's income. That's not a problem. The $100 go through the financial types, and the banks, the securities houses, they will then give it to someone else who can use it. That person borrows it and spends it. 900 plus 100, thousand dollars against the original income of the thousand dollars, the economy moves forward. Mm -hmm. If too many borrowers, rates are raised. Too few, rates are lowered and adjustments are made. But in the world we are in now, and the world we found ourselves in Japan for nearly 15 years, was that you bring rates down to zero, people are still deleveraging. No one's borrowing money. Then what happens when I spend, uh, when I get thousand dollars for income, decide to spend 900 and save hundred dollars? The $100 gets stuck in a banking system somewhere. It becomes a leakage to the income stream it's, because there's no... It's just in the vault. It's right, no one's resort. borrowing and spending money. Yeah. The economy shrinks from 1000 to 900 then because mm -hmm. only $900, that's the part that was spent. Mm -hmm. That's someone else's income. That person gets it, decides to say, let's say he decides to save 10%. He spends 810, decides to save $90, and that $90 gets stuck in a banking system because people are still deleveraging. Yes. Then economy goes from 1,900, 810, 730 very, very quickly, even with zero interest rates. And that's the danger we faced in Japan, and that's exactly how Great Depression 
got so bad so quickly in the U.S. from 1929 to 1933. Everybody was paying down debt. No one was borrowing money. Mm -hmm. And I see the same danger in this part of the world as well. And when you're in th that kind of situation, you try to pump in money through QE2 or QE3, there will be no takers. The money can enter the financial system, but it cannot go any further because the real economy, people in the real side of the economy are all deleveraging. You know, people talk about all oh, government spending me must mean we are using grandchildren's credit card, you know, that kind of talk, which is, you know, uh, very popular things to say. But you have to remember what kind of economy you're going to leave to the next generation as well. Mm -hmm. If you cut now and allow the economy to go from 1,900, 810, 730, there will be a lot more young people who won't be able to go to schools school programs we have to be cut for the many local uh, school districts they won't be able to study art they won't be able to study science because all the programs are being cut and that's a huge cost to the future generations as well science research similarly right when you right. don't do basic science research you don't have r d and new product development 10, 20, 30 years down the path. Right, and, and it's uh, not just science, in the arts field, yes. yeah. all of these areas where people have to come up with new ideas to get, get this society going. Mm -hmm. If these people no longer were able to have those opportunities because they have to go find work or the school programs or cut drastically, then that's all cost to the future generations. And that part is, seems to be missing from the debate. Well, when they talk about fiscal policy and deficits, mm -hmm. that's the flow of activity. But what you might say, the stock of activity, right. or the, excuse me, the stock of accumulated benefits of that activity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like how educated is your workforce, how strong is your infrastructure, how elevated is your understanding of the arts, sciences, and elements of culture. Yeah. Those are all assets mm -hmm. of a society. That's not a dimension. A lot of young people on. lost their education opportunities during the 1930s because the government did not do the right things mm -hmm. once the stock market collapsed. And who, who's paying for that cost? Yeah. That part is missing from our debate altogether. Mm -hmm. Now, here's an interesting element. You sit in Japan, friendships with the United States, very close observation with, of China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know you travel to both places. Yes. The Americans are saying, we don't trust government. We have to cut off government. Mm. At the same time, people are saying, we admire what the Chinese are doing. <laughs> and the Chinese are doing things, infrastructure, education, so forth, run by the government. All of these models exist, mm. and yet the Americans at this critical juncture are saying, we have to shut down the government. We can't trust the government. Government isn't good. Now, how do you explain that? How do you see? Well, uh, China was actually headed toward a perfect balance sheet recession September nine, uh, 2008, mm -hmm. when Lehman shock hit. Chinese house prices were collapsing also. Chinese stock market was collapsing. And so we were all in the same boat at the time. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese in November, early November 2008 put in a massive fiscal stimulus, 17% of GDP. Wow. That's three times larger than the Obama, uh, President Obama's $787 billion package. And not only that, it was implemented very, very quickly. And we know how Chinese can, how quickly they can implement things. Mm -hmm. As a result, e even the economy was headed toward a perfect re balance sheet recession, because of this massive fiscal push from the government, it bounced off. And when Chinese announced that package, everybody around the world was laughing. 8% GDP growth? No way. But they actually achieved 8% growth, yep. even higher than that. And the Chinese people become more confident, start spending money, the economy began to pick up further, and now China is about the only winner in this whole world game of, of economics. Mm -hmm. And what I admire about China is that they are very practical people. Otherwise, that civilization wouldn't have lasted 5,000 years. <laughs> and they are not beholden to ideology of one type or another, especially these guys are communists to begin with. So whatever that works, they just put in place. 
And some of the charts that I have used over the years, which show that Japanese GDP never fell even after bursting of the bubble, Chinese paid a great deal of attention to that chart. Mm. Because at that time, about five years ago, China had both a housing bubble and a stock market bubble, and the economy was doing very well. But their leaders were very, very scared. And with everybody doing fine, economy doing fine, why should the leaders be scared? Well, you we have to remember, current leadership in China is not elected by the people. And they dumped the communism in a garbage can. So they really have some legitimacy problems. If you're elected by the people and the economy goes down, you can still tell the public that, look, I have two more years to go, mm -hmm. so you shut up. <laughs> uh, if you're still practicing communism, and communism is defined by the Communist Party and you're the chairman of the party, you can define whatever the communism to your, to your liking, and if someone complains, you can grab the guy, put him in jail, and that's the end of the story. But at least there's some legitimacy there. But now these people have nothing. They have to deliver the goods. Exactly. That's the only claim to legitimacy they have, and that is that under their leadership, the living standard of Chinese people have improved dramatically, which is true. Mm -hmm. But if a third of the improvement or the half of the improvement is due to the bubble, and once the bubble bursts, and the economy starts shrinking, and people's living standards start falling, then you have a political crisis. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. what they're worried about. So when they saw that Japanese managed to keep the GDP from falling, even though Japanese commercial real estate fell 87% from the peak nationwide. I mean, just imagine Manhattan down 87, San Francisco down 87, Chicago down 87, Orlando down 87. You know, what kind of economy have left here, right? But Japan managed to keep the GDP from uh, falling below the peak of the bubble for the entire 20-year period after bursting of the bubble. So China, Chinese saw that and says, this is what we have to do. Hmm. And that's what they did. And so at the moment, China is the only winner because they are putting the fiscal stimulus. They continue to put in the fiscal stimulus as necessary. And as a result, the economy is doing very well. Tax receipts are growing. They can spend more on the military. They can add to their, their national prestige and national power while everybody else is still struggling. How is the United States, given the tremendous burden of military responsibility our country's been carrying, where we spend more than the rest of the world combined on mm. defense, how in a shriveling economy will the Americans be able to continue to, how do I say, exert that kind of presence in national security around the world? Well, I think the way we are headed, smaller governments, uh, is the wrong way to go. Because that idea of having a small government is fine as long as private sector is healthy mm -hmm. and, and are looking forward. But right now, once in every 70 years when this huge bubble bursts and the private sector balance sheets are, are in horrible shape, private sector is no longer forward looking, they're backward looking, trying to repair their balance sheets by paying down debt, even with zero interest rates. You know, the fact that Americans are deleveraging with zero interest rates shows how sick the private sector is. Right. And when you're in this situation, if you try to shrink the government, the whole thing shrinks and the economy falls into this 1,900, 810, that Spiral. scenario. Yeah. And there will, be, there will be less money for defense. Other countries who are trying to take advantage of the U.S. weakness will have a field day. And I would argue that it's good that China is doing the right things, right, putting the right set of policies. But the way to counter that, which because, because the Chinese are doing the right things, the Chinese economy is doing well, and therefore their defense spending is increasing, the r right way to counter that is not to tell the Chinese to do the wrong economic policy, but for us to put in the right economic policies. Right. Right. And that's not small government at the moment. The government has to play a key role to keep the GDP from falling so that private sector has the income to pay down debt. Yeah. Yes. And once the private sector is healthy, then we reverse our role.
When okay. you look at the United States in comparison with Japan and the length or the duration of repairing of balance sheets, if we were to engage in a 5 or 7 percent of GDP fiscal plan, how mm -hmm. many years do you think it would have to go on until the private sector had put themselves back into that place of balance? Uh, it's a very difficult estimate to make because there are so few examples in the past that we can rely on. Uh, but Japanese took nearly 15 years mm -hmm. before deleveraging stopped. It stopped around 2005, bubble burst uh, 89, 90. 89 90, yeah. 90. So that's 15 years. Uh, this is against the commercial real estate prices falling 87% nationwide. Mm -hmm. U.S. commercial real estate prices fell about half of that, 44%, mm -hmm. and house prices down about 30, 35%, which are, of course, much smaller than the Japanese uh, numbers. And so I don't think U.S. should take 15. I think uh, make it much Five, shorter. Six, seven years. Right, right. Yeah. But to do that, we have to do everything right. Mm -hmm. And Japan did not have to take 15 either. We made two mistakes in the middle. In 1997, uh, Prime Minister Hashimoto, listening to all these people who told him that fiscal policy is not working, you're putting so much building bridges to nowhere, roads to nowhere, look, economy is going absolutely uh, uh, nowhere. Uh, the IMF, the OECD, they all told him to cut budget deficit. And I was advising him at the time, and I said, no, you don't cut. If you cut now, the whole thing will come crashing down. But I was just a private sector economist, not even a Japanese. He listened to all these big shots from abroad and decided to cut. We entered five quarters of negative growth. Complete meltdown of the banking system to go with it. Not like, Ro unlike Roosevelt in 1937, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and as a result, it took Japan nearly 10 years to climb out of that hole. The budget deficit, instead of decreasing by 15 trillion yen, 3% of Japan's GDP, it increased by 16 trillion yen, 68%. And to bring this thing down, because the damage was so large, it took us 10 years. Mm -hmm. And another small mistake was made by Prime Minister Koizumi in year 2001, when he tried to limit Japanese government bond issuance to 30 trillion yen a year. But the gap was bigger than 30 trillion. He tried to keep it at 30, and the economy began uh, showing negative growth again. So those two mistakes cost Japan nearly 10 years, in my view. Mm. And I don't want the United States to make the same mistake. And you could see China, maybe uh, with a bold, aggressive, preemptive response, mm -hmm. they're already out of it. They didn't even yeah. have to go five years. Right, right. And, uh, so it's very interesting to look at this. They have gone a little bit overboard in <laughs> one other area, and yeah. that is that when China put in the massive fiscal stimulus in November 2008, the government also told its banks to lend as much money as you can to get the economy going. Mm -hmm. But on the usual world, usual balance sheet recession world, where private sector is deleveraging, trying to repair their balance sheets, there should be no borrowers, even if the bankers are willing to lend. But in China, they were borrowers, mm. and those were the regional governments, provincial governments. Ah. and People who don't think their balance sheet gets measured. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. And prior to November 2008, uh, regional governments always wanted to borrow more for their mega projects because these regional governments are always competing with each other. But central government was trying to say, no, you can't borrow so much. And they told, the central government also told the banks, don't lend too much to the regional governments. But November 2008, two months after the Lehman collapse, the whole world was in shambles. So the central government says, okay, you can lend to the regional governments as well. And they told the regional governments, you can borrow some money also. Yeah. Massive funds went out of the, the Chinese banking system to the regional governments. And of course, the regional governments spent that for their mega projects. The money then flew into the private sector. And we have a massive housing bubble in China at the moment. Mm. Shanghai, ordinary condominiums costing nearly one million U.S. dollars for people who are making so much less than the average. You know, the average income, yes. yeah. And so now they have these housing bubbles problems that they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And that part, I think they are very serious now because they're afraid that if this kind of house prices remains, there could be a revolt somewhere down the line. 
with the people saying uh, we're working so hard. Affordability we, Yeah, crisis, we cannot afford yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think the clampdown on housing market is real. And we could see some blood uh, in, in that industry or in that sector going forward. But they can always offset the huge negatives from this side by massive public spending on the other side mm -hmm. so that the total GDP should, should be maintained or the, some sort of growth be maintained. But we could see some areas of Shanghai real estate, for example, uh, turning into non-performing loans and, or something worse than that. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing rapid wage growth in China at present? Uh, there have been some. Yeah, so they can become more affordable through increasing wages. Uh, right, but I don't think they can catch up with, uh, with what happened to the housing prices. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I thank you for coming and uh, seeing us today. Ah, oh, quite welcome. And it's thank always you for this good to catch up with you, and we look forward to seeing you at the Bretton Woods Conference. Uh, okay. Thank April. you very much. Thank you. <laughs>